I'm Kay Cottrell from the Late Bloomer Urban Organic Garden Show, and today my guest is Jeff Poppin, affectionately known as the Barefoot Farmer, right? Uh, yes. In Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee. And Jeff, we were talking to you earlier about you preserve about 60% of your 250 acres for forest. Can you talk a little bit about uh, why it's so important to maintain the forest and how that contributes to the overall health of the farm? Well, I like to think about what's going on underneath the soil. And there's a lot of microorganisms that live underground. And many of these are a fungal in nature and they're interconnected. And so the forests uh, have a vast reservoir of this mycorrhizae and mushroom roots, so to speak, that are interconnected. You can put dye in one end of a, a forest and through the mushroom fungal activity, it can, that dye can end up in a tree at the other end of the forest miles Have you ever away. heard about the dye being in a, put into a tree and, and showing up in another tree in the same forest? A dye. Oh, yeah. Well, all the roots graft. All the roots are grafted together. So there's, and they're, they're grafted together with this mycorrhizae from fungal activity. And there's a wide variety of this. There can be tens of thousands of species of different kinds of funguses in the soil. And hundreds of thousands of species of bacteria. And each one of these species of funguses and bacteria live off of specific root exudates of the various species of plants. So they're all kind of connected that way. And so when we have a forest, there's a vast reservoir of microbes that can possibly be very beneficial for agriculture. So all agricultural land, uh, preferably, would have forest around it to help supply some of this uh, activity. So you may wonder how that activity gets there. Well, these are the primary feeders, the fungus and the bacteria. So there's protozoas and amoebas, ciliates, and all these other things that eat the fungi and the bacteria. And they're the secondary feeders. Then there's all sorts of things that eat them nematodes and worms and bugs. And then there's things that eat them, and these would include the birds and mammals and snakes and all the different kinds of things. So there's stuff moving around all the time. And when you have a natural system set up, uh, the plants are able to draw into them what they need. When we don't use chemicals, there's uh, potassium fixing microbes in the soil they're killed when you use the, the chemical fertilizers, but they're live and uh, active in forests and in an organic uh, soil. And so when the plant needs potassium, it sends a signal. And these bacteria and fungal things that are living on the roots of the plant then are getting their nutrition from what's coming off that plant. And they're very specific. You can take the soil from your garden and take it to a, a soil scientist and they'll do a biological assay on it and they'll tell you that you were growing carrots there or you were growing beans just by which uh, of these microbes are active in an active state. Normally they're in a dormant state. So when they're in an active state they can breed really fast and a bacteria can have babies in like just a few seconds and be a grandma in like six seconds and in <laughs> nine seconds it can have all kinds of great grandbabies around and so that these microbial population flushes that happen very quickly and so we want to set the stage in agriculture so that this can happen easily and the best way to do this is to surround your gardens and your farms with wilderness and forests because that's there's a lot of this reserve of this kind of stuff there and there's a uh, all of the leaves and twigs and such as that that fall and rot and form this leaf mold become a very important part of your garden and you don't even have to take it and put it in your garden if you have this proper uh, movement of life going it just all happens and we don't really have to do anything in farming we just basically do nothing and it all just happens well, it's really cool. you do do some digging when you grow potatoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I plow them with a tractor. <laughs> Let me ask you something. A lot of people have the feeling that urban gardening is going to be a big um, 
help in turning around climate change. Um, because the more people that grow food in cities, you know, by 2050 uh, or 2070 or something, 75% of the people on the planet will live in cities. And where are they going to get the food and who's going to be growing it if, if everybody's living in the city? So they feel like that uh, there's going to be a, it's going to be very important for people in the cities to know how to grow their own food. Now, if, can they create their own wilderness, so to speak, around their own little garden, no matter what size it is? Is that conceivable? Of course. So, uh, the way that soils are formed is by the weathering of rocks and the grazing of animals. And so, these are things that we can mimic in our small garden plots by using minerals, lime or ground up rock phosphate or granite or something like these minerals on our, our ground, kind of mimicking glacial activity. And we can make compost piles, which mimics what happens on the forest floor or when uh, grass is grazed and there's manure and such added to the soil. So we study nature and then we mimic these processes in our urban gardens. So uh, most urban areas that I've gardened in have been too shady anyway. There's a lot of shade trees, and that's probably one of the biggest problems for urban gardeners is they, they have... not enough sun. Right, and they have these beautiful shade trees, and they don't want to cut them down, so they don't have enough sun. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to have some kind of uh, wilderness with trees and bushes and so forth. Uh, that's got to be part of the equation for a healthy garden. Yeah, I wish I could think of the quote by M Muir, John Muir about wilderness, but uh, yeah, wilderness is very important. <laughs> <laughs> do you, uh, Jeff, do you feel, I mean, you are, it, it seems to me, first of all, my impression of you is that you're very a uh, laid back and relaxed kind of guy and calm. Um, no, that's just my impression. Uh, <laughs> But I'm wonder you have so much going on here. First of all, you have 250 acres. You're growing how many acres of uh, food crops? Uh, eight? There's, uh, eight acres of vegetables. Eight, eight acres of vegetables. You have an active CSA program. You have a music festival. You have um, biodynamic conference workshops here. Um, how, do you, how do you keep your focus with so many different things going on on this farm? Well, I don't do anything else. Yeah. Just manage what's going on here. I mean... Not, not well. <laughs> <laughs> to me, just getting one field planted would be probably all I could handle. <laughs> well, uh, it's all I've done. I've always lived on a farm, and I've always made my, lovey, my living by growing stuff. And so I don't really know anything else. Did your did you get this from your grandparents or your parents or? Um, my father was a farmer, but I, I claimed that I didn't learn how to do farm work from him. I learned how to get out of farm work because I was a farm kid. <laughs> right, right. But something must have rubbed off. Yeah, something. So, do you consider um, your farm a biodynamic farm? Uh, yes, we been making the biodynamic preparations for 30 years and applying them on our farm. And, uh, you know, some people, well, one person responded to uh, a, a recent webcast saying that uh, they did a little bit of this, a little bit of biodynamic, they do a little bit of permaculture, and then they do, they kind of come up with their own plan. That's good too, right? I mean, it's I don't, all good. I don't know them specifically. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't be able but, to comment unless I saw their soil. Okay. So it really comes down to the health of the soil. and. It's going to be more healthy if you're practicing, in your opinion, biodynamic agriculture? I find that the biodynamic method is the cheapest way to grow real high-quality vegetables. And uh, I think it's good for the pasture land, too. If you have a really small garden, and obviously you won't have a tractor or a plow, uh, what do you think about no-till gardening? I don't... Uh, in no-till gardening, I think, should be called earthworm-tilled gardening because all sure. gardens have to be tilled. Yep. Uh, you have to bring in air into the soil because of the, uh, the compaction and, and such. So the soil needs to be fluffed up. 
whether we get worms to do it or do it ourselves. Okay. So in a no-till garden, the first thing you do is you double dig it. And you go down and take a, a spit of soil out along a trench, and then you go down another eight or ten inches, and you work up and fluff up that subsoil, and you add lime and sands and, and gravels and stuff so it'll drain well. And then you take the soil next to it and push it over on top of that, and then uh, eventually and do, the, and do the same thing underneath that so that you have the whole garden area is 18 inches to, to 2 feet deep, and you can stick a rake in it that deep <laughs> very easily. Right. And that goes in there. It's very exciting. I and, know. And, well, and I'm down to about 8 inches. Right, I'm, and that's and you can't farm. Exciting. You can't farm that way. Can't, you no. won't you won't have a good as good a garden as if you go down deeper because uh, we want to have the soil opened up to the subsoil so that we can get the moisture when it's dry so we never irrigate so this is um, teaching how to raise food with no irrigation and you use the subsoil moisture and you draw it up by having the plants sensitized to be able to draw into them what they need so it's mm -hmm. important to have this physically loosened all the way down. Mm -hmm. And then we use lots of you know compost and organic materials on top, but they have to be well digested. So composting is a two-part uh, process of breaking down the original materials, but then also the building up of a stable clay humus complex. So that's why it's really important to add 10 to 20 percent soil to the compost pile so that the compost breaks down and then builds back up using all these microbes. And then we can get a soil that's very responsive mm -hmm. and it really wants to become a plant. So not that many people are fortunate enough to have a farm uh, these days. All gardeners have to have a farm. Right. So the garden uh, gardens need farms because that's where they get their hay and manure and wood chips Absolutely. and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and uh, there's a lot of farms and the gardeners and farmers just need to hook up. But I oftentimes suggest to the gardeners that they, when they go visit a farmer, that they bring them a basket of tomatoes or sweet corn or something and then maybe ask for some manure. <laughs> well, you told me something earlier about when uh, people come and train here to be farmers and they go off and they go, I want to buy a farm. You tell them what? Don't buy a farm, buy a, a tractor is what you told me. Well, yeah, uh, farm land has a value now above and beyond the value of crops that can be raised on it. It has a developmental type of value and investment values and things like this. So a lot of farmland now isn't owned by farmers. It's owned by, you know, doctors and lawyers and people, other people that have invested in farmland. And consequently, uh, there's a real lack of people that know how to farm. So I suggest to young people that they learn how to farm and then ally themselves with somebody that has some land that wants to see it farmed correctly and but doesn't uh, know how. Like landless farmers. I mean, there are lots of people who would just jump at the chance to do that, I would think. Oh, uh, they, if they had the training. Yeah. And that's what, that's one thing you're trying to do here with your grant, isn't it, to train more uh, young farmers? Is that? Uh, yeah, I've been doing a, a farmer's trainer training program here for several decades. Oh, several decades. Wow. Okay. Well, obviously, I, I have a lot to learn about uh, your farm. <laughs> well, I'm keeping you from uh, cutting your hay in your field, right? Uh, no, I'm <laughs> going to go cut it here in a minute. <laughs> I'm happy to talk with you. We were talking a little bit earlier about um, you're doing all you can to be really an evangelist for uh, preserving and conserving uh, farmland, forest land, uh, treating the earth uh lightly and with respect and uh do you feel that and, and and a lot of people know who you are and what you're trying to do here you have your music music festival so a lot of people come here and they and they experience your farm do you feel like uh you're you're making a difference that there's there's a 
a, a lot of people now that's that are waking up to 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 the concept of uh, we are all one and we all, we're all interconnected and we have to uh, uh, take care of what we have, the natural resources that we have. Well, I'm I'm part of the organic farming movement, uh, so I'm sure we've had um, had a uh, an effect over the last you know forty or fifty years. Uh, this. Uh, what What more can we do than just talk to people and try to excite them about preserving what we have? <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, having an understanding of uh, a farming would help people make choices uh, that that the earth maybe sh is not the wisest to divide the earth's resources up according t to material self-interest. That the earth really does belong to everybody here. And there are several problems. You mentioned global warming, for one, or climate change, I think you said. And we know how to fix that. We know that if we raised, you know, the fields that are in Illinois and Indiana and Iowa, if those were in grass and we had big herds of animals moving through it, that in three or five years or so we could bring the carbon back to pre-automobile era emissions. We know how to do it. It's very simple because we can suck the carbon out of the air with all the grasses and things, and if we graze it properly, the animals will push that carbon back in the ground and sequester it. And yeah, and we can we can fix this, but we have to quit using weapons materials on the soil. And this is the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus that have become so predominantly used since World War One. And that's really when the organic movement started, was when uh, they had that big war. And before that, everything was organic, and it was uh, small farms. And a lot of what I teach and what I study are pre-World War I agricultural textbooks for grade schoolers. And these have everything in them that I need to know to run a farm successfully. And this big war happened, and it was predicted that it would be over, you know, in a few months, and, and it was. And so, uh, on the other side of the world, the British Navy defeated Germany, and the war was over. And this was in the Falkland Islands, off the coast of Chile, over a pile of bird shit, which was the only known source of nitrate in the world. Germany couldn't make bombs or gunpowder, and the war was over. And that's when Haber and Bosch figured out how to synthesize nitrogen from the air. Over every square foot of soil, there's 1,400 pounds of nitrogen. Really? And so Repeat that again. Over every square foot of soil, there's 1,400 pounds of nitrogen in the atmosphere. And these people developed these, this weapons industry, and Germany immediately had thousands of these weapons facilities sprout up, and they sold the, the nitrate, not only to Germany, but they sold it to England, too. Yes. They didn't care about that. And uh, after the war, they turned those weapons facilities into fertilized factories. And this is the military takeover of agriculture, which then caused the backlash, and Rudolf Steiner, a few years later, gave a course on agriculture explaining that we needed to go back to using compost and we couldn't, shouldn't use those weapons materials because they kill the life of the soil. And when we have life in the soil, then the plants that are growing have life in them and can give us the materials where we can raise our consciousness. So consciousness doesn't get raised through conversation. It gets raised through proper nutrition from properly managed farmland. And so the best thing we can do is to make sure that our nutrition is coming from humus soils. Consequently, uh, then we'll be able to do things that reflect what we think. 
because you can have great thoughts and great feelings, but you still don't know what to do. And your question is, you know, what can we do? And to do anything, we have to have nutrition based on healthy soils. I agree. <laughs> nutrition comes from livestock and grains. And that's what people want when they get hungry. And uh, these things aren't grown in backyard gardens. No. So... Uh, I, I did grow some amaranth. <laughs> and quinoa. <laughs> well, as a farmer, it's important for me that I do things efficiently and that the calories that I expend are far less uh, than the calories of what I produce. So I have to think in terms of doing things efficiently so that I can grow a lot of food with as little work and effort as possible. And I find uh, a lot of uh, 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 small backyard gardens uh, they're using undigested organic material. They only have their soil broke to six or eight inches. They're uh, not mineralizing, and consequently they're not getting the most they could out of it. And If you are not able to graze animals over your urban garden or whatever garden, how can you do that? Well, all farming and gardening requires animals, and the urban gardener has animals in their garden. They have worms and bugs and uh, mice and and squirrels are a big problem I know for them. <laughs> Raccoons. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of uh, activity in nature, and as we were talking earlier, everything in nature is interconnected. So when there's wilderness around, there's manures that are made available to the gardens. You know, when you collect leaf litter, you're getting some manure and stuff with that. But the, the uh, the thing that has to turn around is American agriculture, and it's not going to be done by backyard gardeners. It's going to be done by consumers. And the people who have a backyard garden may be more interested in adding to their own garden produce grains and eggs and uh, meat and things like this that are grown in a way that's uh, copacetic with their thinking about these things, mm -hmm. which for me would be in this organic biodynamic uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I certainly encourage people to grow backyard gardens. I think it's like really, really important, but it's just kind of a step on the way to changing American agriculture. So you said it's going to be changed by consumers. How will consumers change industrial agriculture? They quit going to the grocery store. <laughs> okay. You have to get your food from the land. Grocery stores are not a good place to get food. Okay. They're probably maybe better than restaurants, but they're just those are not good places to eat at. I ran into somebody on this trip, and um, we were in a restaurant, a farm-to-table restaurant, which was wonderful, and uh, she told me that her husband was a farmer, and um, and she quickly said, he's not organic. And she said, I eat organic, but he's not organic. I said, what does he grow? And she said, soybeans and corn. And I said, well, and I tried to explain a little bit about. Well, uh, but what you're he, getting at, yeah. uh, Kay, is, is something that uh, when we study agricultural literature, one of the greatest books is called the Bible. And it talks about these grain barons that hoarded all the grains and how important grain was and how powerful grain can make a few people. In this case, it was the people that owned the pyramids. And so uh, the consciousness of the people that, that figured another way was a huge step for humanity. And that's why that book is so important. And these people found a way to make the land flow with milk and honey by grazing cattle, sheep, and goats. They didn't use pigs and horses and chickens. And they knew and learned that grazing those animals, they could make their land more fertile. And this is because a cow 
can live off of two acres of land but make four acres fertile. No other animals besides ruminants have this ability. Besides what? Ruminants. Oh. The cattle, goats, and oh, sheep. The, okay. the, the animals that they talk about in the Bible or in Indian mm -hmm. religious literature too. And so these people, because of this understanding, were able to break away from the grain barons. And over the course of the next couple thousand years, slash and burn agriculture was replaced by grazing and raising crops. But it wasn't really until uh, 150 years ago that uh, we learned specifically which of the elements are needed to make these crops grow. And we started using them not in their natural form with manures and composts, but in these artificially produced synthesized forms. And this is where the problem lies, because we don't need all that corn and soybeans. The only reason that we grow that is to keep the weapons industries, fertilized factories alive and going. And so it's this myth that, that these grains are feeding the world. They're actually creating starvation. And we do this by supplying grains to poor countries and killing agriculture in those countries. So uh, what's happened is, is that as soon as the weapons industry realized that they could sell this stuff for fertilizers, immediately agricultural education took a 180 degree turn. And instead of the farming book saying, well, every farm has to have some cows and goats and sheep and, and animals on it, it said only grow crops on your farm or only grow animals in confined area and feed them crops from these other uh, farms. When you separate animal husbandry and crop production, then it becomes necessary to import fertilizers. If you have both on the farm, you don't have to buy these fertilizers. You can keep your soil alive and you can keep raising the consciousness of the people that eat the food. So the uh, only reason to raise corn and soybeans is to fund the weapons industry. That's the only reason to do it. Animals don't have digestive capacities to utilize that stuff. Cows live on, live on grass. That's what they can live on. And, I mean, they're not... Even a grass-fed cow gets grain because every head of grass has a little bit of grain in it, you know. And so uh, we have to break out of this, this sort of fog that we're in, thinking that modern agriculture is, is feeding people. It's not. It's, it's really causing a lot of problems. You know, most of our environmental problems are agriculturally oriented. And, uh, uh, and then the poverty is is because of we don't have the jobs that agriculture could supply and uh, we don't have the caring for the land and we don't have communities and family situations like we do when we have farms. And so it's the revitalization of American farmland that urban gardeners are really wanting to do when they have a nice mowed lawn and a little urban garden. When they have a mowed lawn, that makes them realize that there's potential for food production because they're mowing it and it grows up and they mow it and it grows up. That's how humus is made, just like when cattle eat it and stuff. So it's this innate feeling that people have that they want to grow stuff and they want to be around an area where the soils are improving. They don't know that specifically, but this is something that's kind of innate in folks. They, they just want to be around that because it makes them feel secure. They know that their children are going to have good soil and food and such so uh, you but know. we've kind of gotten away from that and, and most people like you say go to the supermarket and they're and a lot of kids are completely disconnected and have no idea where their food comes from well that's just in your the experiences that you've had but worldwide 70 percent of what people eat is grown by small farmers on five acres or less most people still get their food from backyard gardening most people still live very simply. They may have a TV, but they may be living in a mud hut. <laughs> so worldwide, there's a much broader understanding than what we've been 
sort of given as far as our experiences here in American culture. Mm -hmm. And in the cities, really. Right. So when I say that 70% of the food eaten is grown by small backyard farmers, that puts me in the 30% with Monsanto. Yeah. I'm not one of those small backyard. I have more than five acres right. that I'm growing food on. So what all that these big corn soybean operations are doing is is very detrimental to the soil. And then they feed these, these CAFOs, these big giant uh, CAFO things. This is a horrible way to, 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 to get food. And almost all of the food in the grocery stores is raised with chemicals or in CAFOs. And it's just not good food if you're trying to raise consciousness. It's just not good stuff to eat. Yeah. So we have to not only have our urban gardens, but then we have to take it the next step, which would be try to find some place that's growing the grains properly or growing the animals properly and reconnecting. And if we can't find it, then we have to start these farms. And consumers can get together and do these things. They sure can because it's only the consumer dollars that are funding this thing and keeping it going. Right. So you have a situation in America where one out of every four meals is eaten in a fast food restaurant and very few people are cooking at home and they feel like they don't have time. And uh, we see that the, num the percentage of uh, money spent on food goes down, down, down in the same ratio that the money spent on health care goes up, up, up. And we simply need to start put more of our energy into getting good soils where we can have good food and we'll be healthier, the planet will be healthier, we'll have lots of good jobs to do and, and uh, it'll be a lot better environment for everybody. Thank you so much for talking with me today, Jeff. Jeff Poppin, the barefoot farmer in Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee. We'll talk Thank to you, you again. Thank you. <laughs>